We are built with the desire to know love, love that takes us back when we've messed up and gives before it takes, the kind of love that meets us where we're at but challenges us to go further. At Grace Church, we're here to help all of our friends and neighbors know that kind of love. Hey everybody, I'm Kristen, the Communications Director here at Grace Church. Happy New Year, welcome to 2021, we finally made it. If you're like me and you are so glad to see 2020 gone, just leave an emoji in the comment section and show us how you feel. If this is your first time watching, what a great way to start the new year. Just text the word NEW to the number at the bottom of your screen. We would love to connect with you and just send you a small gift to say thanks for watching. Now before we hop into our brand new mini series. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for everything that you have done over the past year and everything you're about to do over this next year. And I pray that you would help us to identify areas where we can grow in our relationship with you over this next year, that it would be a breakthrough year for so many of us. Uh, I pray that we'd be able to uh, identify next steps that we can take in our relationship with you and that you would give us boldness to take those steps. I pray this in your name, amen. Happy New Year. Uh, congratulations on making it through the most difficult year that any of us would have ever imagined. I feel like everybody here deserves some type of a trophy uh, just for making it out of 2020. Uh, congratulations. I am incredibly excited for what we're going to see God do in our lives in 2021. I announced uh, to you guys back in our anniversary service at the beginning of November that we're going to be starting two new Grace Churches in 2021. One's going to be on the North Shore, probably in Peabody or Salem, and the second one is going to be in Norton. If you live closer to Norton than any of our other locations, this church is going to be for you. Uh, maybe you don't even attend one of the other locations. You've just started becoming a part of Grace Church since the quarantine and haven't been able to check any of them out yet, but you live in maybe Plainville or Mansfield, Foxborough, New Bedford, Taunton, Attleboro, uh, maybe you even live in Providence, I, I have no idea. But we're going to be opening up a church location closer to you uh, in, in Norton. If you are interested in being a part of that, then I want to invite you to an informational meeting on January 15th, it's a Friday night, at the Grace Church Norton location on 1 New Taunton Avenue in Norton. We're going to have an online option available also so you can be a part of that meeting even if you're not able to be there in person because we don't want to leave anybody out. Uh, but you're probably wondering who the pastor of that location is going to be. His name is Stephen Lucas. He was born and raised uh, in, in that area. Actually, he was born, I think, in Taunton, but he was raised in schooling and all of that kind of stuff and even went to church his whole life in Norton. Uh, that church is relaunching as a Grace Church location. Uh, Stephen is the pastor there, uh, and I wanted you guys to meet him, hear, hear from him, get to hear him preach. And today he's going to be sharing with us what he believes uh, God's put on his heart that's going to help us grow in our relationship with God. So it's my privilege to introduce you guys, Grace Church's newest pastor, the pastor of Grace Church Norton. This is Stephen Lucas. Hey everybody, if you're just joining us for the first time, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Steve-O. I am the location pastor at our soon-to-be new Grace Church Norton location. Uh, Grace Church has been a huge influence in my time in ministry so far, and I'm so excited to be joining the Grace Church family. I have two daughters. One is a two-month-old who still has that fresh new baby smell, and then I have a two-year-old named Haven uh, who's super into princesses right now. Everything is Anna and Elsa from Frozen, and uh, we're kind of inundated at my house with all sorts of princess toys, all the Frozen toys. She has a castle. Uh, she has all sorts of dresses and everything around the house. I'm a little scared that our house is going to turn into uh, Elsa's Frozen castle from the first movie. Uh, but uh, with all those toys, there's really only one big downside, and that's the glitter that is everywhere in our house. Uh, and for some reason, glitter comes off of toys and dresses really easily, but it sticks to my clothes and my skin like nothing else. Doesn't matter how much I shower, doesn't matter how much I just try to scrub off the glitter, it just stays. So inevitably, whenever I'm speaking at our location, I'll have somebody who comes up after a message and just asks me if I'm wearing glitter which I would love to say no, 
But at the same time, I realize they're probably asking me because it looks like I have some sort of eyeliner that's glittery or blush that's glittery. So saying no isn't gonna help anything. But with that, it might be really simple and silly, but I don't think we realize how much our environments rub off on us until they're truly stuck to us. And this past year, it feels like we've been an ever-changing environment a political environment, social environment, cultural environment, maybe even your own living environment has changed a lot. Everybody was doing house projects, trying to uh, change the, the color of their living room or, or rearrange furniture just to bring a little excitement to the time that we were locked indoors. But I don't think any environment has changed as much as the one that we create for ourselves with our screens. According to eMarketer, the average adult spends three hours and 43 minutes on their phone every single day. And all those people with flip phones bring that number way down, which means if you have a smartphone, you are probably spending upwards of four hours a day on your phone. We're using our phones more than ever before. We're using screens more than ever before. Actually, TechCrunch came out with a, a stat that said the average household has the TV on six hours a day. And it just makes me wonder, how is it that this new environment that we're creating for ourselves using screens is actually affecting us? And if you're at home right now, uh, or, or you're just watching right now, if you could just give me a nod, uh, if you have some sort of social media account, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, if you're using any of those, just give me a little nod. Don't nod right now as if you're using it. I'm hoping we're the only active tab on your computer. Uh, but at the same time, we're, we're on it all the time. We don't realize how much time we're spending there. Uh, even if you've ever lost your phone, we feel that sense of anxiety, worry, where's my phone, where, where is it? I don't know where my phone would be on my arm, but uh, we lose our phone. We feel nervous, anxious, almost as if we lost one of our children. Not that I know how that feels, uh, but why do we do that? We do that because we don't feel like ourselves without our cell phones. And I don't think that God ever desired or intended any one object in our lives to dictate how we feel about ourselves. And I don't think it's God honoring for any one platform, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, to actually have the power over us to make us feel happy, excited, sad, nervous, fearful, or angry. And it's because of that weight that those platforms have in our lives or those sites have in our lives that I feel really confident in saying that there's something about social that's not working. Luckily for us, there's a guy named Paul who wrote a letter to a church in Rome called Romans. And in chapter 12 of that letter, he writes to the Roman church saying that there's actually a type of life that's not defined as much by our culture, but is actually defined by God as good, pleasing, and perfect. And that word perfect just means mature. And I think all of us would desire to have a life that the God of the universe would say, that's mature, that's good, that's pleasing. And so he says in chapter 12, verse 1, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he would find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. What Paul is saying is that each of us could live a life that God would define as good, pleasing, and perfect. Each of us could live a life that's not defined by what people behind a screen would say about us or defined by what we experience on just a, a two by four inch screen, but actually each of us could step into a life that is good, perfect, and pleasing simply by letting three things be true about our lives. And the first thing is to present our lives to God as a living sacrifice. One of the things I love about scripture is that it doesn't just tell us a bunch of things to do in order to be a good person. It's not just a bunch of rules, it actually gives the why behind everything. And so when Paul is writing to this church, he doesn't just tell them, hey, you should do this, this, and this in order to live this type of life. He gives this church and he gives us reading this now the why. 
Why should I care or why should I give my life as a living sacrifice to God? Paul actually says it's because of all God has done for us. Or in other translations, it actually says because of God's mercy. The natural question is, is there anything in your life that you could look at and say that it's thanks to God's mercy? Maybe for you, it's your spouse. If you have an awesome spouse, that's awesome. Um, I, I love my wife and she is a blessing from God, absolutely. She puts up with so much stuff from me. Uh, or maybe it's your kids, that you have great kids and, and they're, they're kind or, or you love the relationship that you have with them. Maybe you didn't have that type of relationship growing up with your parents, but you're so thankful to God that you're, you and your kids have this great relationship. Or, or maybe it's the college you got into or your kids got into that's a result of the intelligence God gave you or the drive that God gave you. Those are all part of God's mercies. Or maybe for you, it's the, uh, the Christmas presents you got, except for the socks. All of us have that aunt who doesn't seem to realize that I could get socks for myself any other time in the year, but she feels the need to get me them on Christmas. Uh, but, but maybe it's those Christmas presents, or maybe it's just the reality that you have a relationship with God. Like that is the mercy in your life. But for many of us, including me, I usually don't think of my motivation or my drive to do something good, especially if it's a, a command or it's, a, it's something given to me by an authority figure to do as the mercy from them. I usually think of my motivation as to avoid the or else or avoid the punishment or avoid the consequences of if I don't do that. Our default setting isn't to think of authority as benevolent or loving or merciful, but thank God he's different. See, this passage actually says that our drive to actually offer our lives as living sacrifices isn't because of our fear of God's wrath. It's not because of our fear of God's judgment. It's not because of our fear of God's punishment. It's actually because of his mercy. You see, fear freezes and mercy moves. That fear actually sets the boundaries of our lives. That if you're afraid of heights, you stay low. If you're afraid of your past, you're always going on to the next thing to try to avoid the consequences of that past. Or if you're afraid of the future, you live in the past. But what the Bible says is actually that when we cast our fears on God, that his perfect love casts out all fear. That fear is a terrible motivator, but mercy moves us to the type of life that God is calling us towards. And so when it comes to talking about our phones, I wanna make sure you know, we're not talking about this because I think God hates your phone or hates your screen, uh, unless you have an Android, maybe he does. But for any of us who, uh, when we're talking about this, that's not the motivation. The motivation is I don't want to miss out on all of the mercies God's given me because all of my attention is on a screen, whether it's my TV, my computer, my laptop, uh, my phone, like whatever it is, I don't want to miss out on all of these mercies, all these blessings that God's given me. All of these are a blessing. Like I'm so thankful that I had a phone to connect with my family earlier this year when all of us were stuck inside. Like even the fact I'm, I'm using an iPad to preach right now, like that's, it's a blessing. It's a good thing. And I realize too, I'm a Fitbit wearing iPhone using millennial talking about this, but I do know that there has to be a balance with this blessing that I don't think God desires the most influential voice in your life to be Siri or Alexa. I think God actually wants your life to be defined by his mercy. In fact, the entire book of Romans is about God's mercy. Chapters one through four focus on the fact that we're all guilty of sin. What is sin? It's disobedience to God and selfishness towards other people. And that because of that, we're deserving of separation from God. But in chapter five, Paul writes to the Roman church and he says in verse eight, but God showed his great love, like didn't just talk about his great love, didn't think about his great love for us, but showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Meaning, while we were still determined to disobey him, while we were still living lives characterized by our own selfishness, God sent Jesus to offer mercy. That God doesn't just give us what we deserve, he puts another offer on the table called mercy, and mercy has a name, and its name is Jesus. 
But so Paul writes that our motivation isn't fear to give our, our entire selves to God as living sacrifices, even our relationship with our phone or our relationship with our TV. It's not out of fear of God that we offer all of ourselves, that it's actually the mercy of God. But unfortunately, many of us settle for giving God most of our lives, but not all of it. There's a, a figure in history named Charlemagne. He lived in the 700s, and he's just known for being a powerful political and military force. He founded the Holy Roman Empire, not the Roman Empire, but the Holy Roman Empire. But one of the things that he would do with his soldiers is he would have them all be baptized. And that sounds great, but there was one problem. And that problem was that he would have them fully baptized underwater except for their sword-wielding arm that the water would cover them except for this arm. And it was a symbol that we're going to give God everything in our lives. He can have all of us except for the one thing that I think will give me exactly what I want on my terms. And, and I wonder, what is that sword wielding arm for you? Or what's in that sword wielding hand for you that will give God most of our lives but I don't want to give him my wallet or I don't want to give him my relationship with my phone or I don't want to give him my current romantic relationship or, or I don't want to give him my sexuality or what I watch on Netflix or what I consume online. Like I, I don't want to give him certain things. And, and you might be thinking, well, what's the big deal if I give God most of my life? That's still, that's still pretty good. Well, there's another story in Greek mythology that actually reflects Charlemagne's story. And that's the story of Achilles. Achilles was known for being this great mighty hero that he was given godlike powers because he was dipped in this liquid that gave him godly strength. It was like the, the god juice. And so he was dipped in that liquid, but only one part of him stayed out of it. And that was his heel, his Achilles heel. And if you're a sports fan, you understand what a big deal your Achilles is if it ruptures or if it tears, uh, that it's actually considered the worst injury in sports. Like it's so hard to come back from. And so for Achilles, it was this one small area of himself that was not dipped in, that undid all of his strength. And my worry is that we would become comfortable with just giving God most of our lives, except for that one thing, thinking it's not gonna affect us. All the while, Satan wants to use that one small part that we didn't submit to God to try to undo everything that God's already trying to do in your life. And so the first thing that Paul writes is to give our lives as living sacrifices. And then the second thing that he desires to be true of the, the Roman church in order for them to live that good and pleasing life is to not copy the patterns of this world. He says in verse two, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. And that behavior and customs is like the rhythms of everybody else, the patterns that everybody else lives their life with. And that can be so hard to resist because we don't wanna, we don't wanna miss out on things or, or we wanna stay somewhat in the know of, of what's going on. But the problem is when those patterns draw us farther and farther away from God and farther and farther away from the person that God is calling us to be. And, and there are two principles in psychology that actually point to the, how this happens. The first one is the law of cognition. And that says the thing that you think about most is actually the thing that you move towards. And there's a pastor named Craig Grishel who says that the, your life moves in the direction of your strongest thought. That our lives move towards the things that we think about the most. And I know that's true in my life when it comes to even like cookies. If I'm home, it's late at night, I start thinking like, man, I'm a little hungry. And I start thinking about cookies. I want to go to the store and get dough or I will scrounge everywhere in our house to try to find the ingredients for cookies. And I might just substitute if we don't have it, if we don't have eggs, I'll just substitute with a second stick of butter. Like I'm just, I, I want those, right? And, and so when we think about something, our lives move towards that thing that we're thinking about. But the second principle is the law of exposure. And that says that we start to become like the things we spend the most time around. And if I were to put that in like a really simple formula, it would be that your time, so how much time you spend, plus your content, what you spend time engaging with, watching, listening to, equals who you become. And that has huge implications for all of us, but especially when it comes to how we deal with the screens 
in our lives. Businessinsider.com reports that the average person touches their phone, just touches it, like individual types, picks it up, all of that, 2,617 times a day. Imagine if we touched our Bible more than we touched our phones. And it also says that the average person unlocks their phone, so just opens it to see if they have any notifications, even if they don't have any notifications that, uh, that their home screen actually told them about. We'll still open it just in case, just to check. Uh, but the average person will open their phone, unlock it six to seven times an hour. We're lost without our phones. So what if we cut the cord a little bit? What if we put it down for a while? And maybe you're listening to this and you hear that and, and you feel this resistance in your heart to that idea. I would say the greater level of resistance you feel to that idea, maybe the greater need you have to actually practice this. Like what if we talk to God more than we talk to Siri or Alexa? How would your life change? If you replace the content that you've been consuming that may be unhealthy with godly content in his voice and, and making space for God to influence your life, how would your life change? But maybe more importantly, what do you need to change in your life in order to make that change happen? Don't copy the patterns and behaviors of this world. And the third thing that Paul says is to allow God to change the way you think. He says, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. According to that formula, the time plus content equals who I become. If I really want to experience some change, if I really want to allow God to be the greatest influence in my life, I need to cut back on the time I spend on unhealthy content and increase the time that I spend with new content. And so I have two really simple life hacks for you, two simple ways that you can actually start making this happen. And the first one is by starting your day better. Like what if you didn't touch your phone until you touched your Bible? And I know some of you probably use your phone as your Bible. And, and I would just say for the sake of having a distraction-free uh, time with God, what if you just grabbed a physical Bible and you just said, I'm going to read a portion of this. I'm still going to check the verse of the day or I'm going to check in on things or I'm going to highlight things in, in my phone, but I'm just going to make sure that I spend a little time with God first. Or maybe it's not even touch your Bible before you touch your phone. Maybe it's just have some time in touch with God through prayer before you open your phone. Start your day better. I want you to listen to King David in Psalm 119 about how he actually practiced this, how devout and how focused he was on having his own time with God that was distraction free. In Psalm 119, he says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And I think that's important that this isn't meditation or memorization of the Bible for the sake of knowing more Bible. David actually says that there's a tangible result that comes from filling our hearts with God's content for our lives. He says that it's so that I do not sin against you. Really saying, so my life isn't characterized by my disobedience to God and my relationships aren't affected by my constant selfishness. He says there's a freedom that I can experience from those two things by simply replacing that content with what God has to say into my life. He continues and he says, I praise you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. I have recited aloud all of the regulations you've given us. I have rejoiced in your laws as much as in riches. I will study your commands and reflect on your ways. I will delight in your decrees and not forget your word. So the first one is start your day better. The second tip is to end your day better. It's been said that the sunset was actually meant as God's way of telling everybody to rest, to slow down for the day. That it was a natural kind of time out for everybody because you couldn't do things when things were dark. You couldn't continue to work. And the more tech that we've created, the, the more we've actually been able to circumvent that. And that's not a bad thing. That's just the reality of where we are. But what if, rather than living without any sort of sunset, 
you gave your technology, you gave all the screens in your life a sunset. What if you just simply said, at a certain time of night, I'm gonna unplug. I'm gonna leave my phone in a different room than where I sleep. Like so many people struggle with insomnia, struggle with not being able to sleep. All the while, there's so many studies about how blue light stops you from being able to sleep or hinders the, the quality of your sleep. So what if we just chose to, to take a time out so the end of my day, I'm actually experiencing time with my loved ones that's distraction free. And, and I, I would say this, that you're gonna find that your real life relationships are gonna deepen as your interactions with your phone lessen. But the rub is that nothing will change unless you choose to make a change in your life. Like God is going to start working in your heart as you allow to make space for him, but you're connected with your life. And if you want some life change, you might have to actually make some change yourself. So where do I go from here? Well, what I want to make sure you know is that you will be tempted to just listen to this message and think, wow, I never thought of my interactions with a screen that way before and then not do anything. Or you're going to feel a resistance to this because we're all very comfortable with our screens. That's why we spend so much time with them. But what I would encourage you to actually take an assessment of, just self-assess, is how resistant am I to this idea of putting my phone down for a little bit each day or turning off the TV for a while when I could watch it or I could spend some time with my loved ones. And the more resistance you feel towards that, the more you might have to do this. It might actually create even more of a positive impact in your life. Long-term change is an inside job. And so what I would encourage you to do is focus on God's mercies in your life. Once again, none of this is to say that God hates your phone. That's not the case. It is a blessing. It helps us connect with people. But if it stops us from connecting with the people that we're physically in a room with because we're trying to connect with the next YouTube video, then it's a problem. Long-term change is an inside job, so allow God to start revealing to you all of the mercies he's given you because I don't want to miss out on God's mercies because I'm looking at my phone. So maybe you've known Jesus for a long time, but you've allowed the voices from your phone or on the TV or in whatever podcast you're listening to to take time away from God's voice in your life. So what I'd really ask of you, based on God's mercies, is to make space for Him. Or maybe you're listening to this and you've never started a relationship with God. That you're new to all this, by the way, we're so glad that you're just checking us out and, and you're here. But maybe your next step isn't just to unplug from your phone, but it's actually to connect with your God. That Paul wrote, while we were yet sinners, Christ came to die for us, for you. That Jesus gave up everything in heaven. He stepped out of eternity and into our reality just so that you could have an opportunity to find and follow him. Dear God, I just thank you for who you are. I thank you for uh, the fact that you don't want us to miss out on your mercies. You don't want us to miss out on the life that you've called us to live, that you actually have such good plans for us and you want us to be able to connect not just with you but with the people that you dearly care about our friends and neighbors and so i ask that you would give us the courage that you would convict us of the areas that we need to make adjustments of but you'd give us the courage to actually make real change in our life so that we wouldn't copy the same patterns as everybody else in our lives that we would spend the time with you in order to fill ourselves up and make an impact in the lives of other people. Amen. If you wouldn't consider yourself a follower of Jesus, I want you to know that Jesus did give us that mercy on the table, uh, but you can take or leave a gift. I'd encourage you to take it. And here's what I want you to know about that gift that Jesus gave you, that it, it's life. Uh, Jesus lived a perfect life. Uh, to be an example to all of us of what it would look like if somebody lived their entire life in connection with God. And then he died on a cross for our sin, that disobedience to God and selfishness towards other people that we're all guilty of being included. And then he rose from the dead so that our lives don't have to be characterized 
or narrated by our addictions, whether it's to a screen or anything else. Our lives don't have to be dominated by the voices of everyone else, of what they think about us, or, or the fear of missing out on, on things, that our life actually can have freedom that comes from knowing Jesus. And so if you want to start that relationship with Jesus, I simply want you to say this in the quietness of your home or, or wherever you're watching. Jesus, I'm all in. I'm all in. And if you prayed that, First of all, I just want to say that's so exciting. That's awesome. Uh, I'm so happy for you that you're starting uh, your faith journey with Jesus starting today. Uh, what I would like you to do is there's going to be a number on the screen. And if you could just text that number all in, we don't want you to go through life alone. And we want to help you at the start of your faith journey. And so let us know if you went all in with Jesus today. And for those of you who already know Jesus, you would consider yourself a follower of Jesus. Uh, we have a couple options for next steps for you. Um, the, the number on the screen, that same number, you can just simply text get help. If you're struggling in, in any area that uh, maybe it's financially, you're struggling to pay the bills or, or uh, get food, we don't want you to go through that alone. Uh, we want to be a church that's life-giving, that's hope-giving, uh, that, that shares and is generous. And so let us know if you're struggling. We want to help you out. If you want to uh, start giving, you want to support what we're doing here at Grace Church so that we can help even more people and continue to share the good news of Jesus, uh, text GIVE. Uh, and if you're new, if this is your first time checking us out, thank you so much for checking us out. Uh, simply text NEW and we'll be in touch with you really soon. Thank you so much. We're going to end uh, today with just two songs. Bye, guys. I'll see you soon. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart, I worship you, I worship you, you are here. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, you are here, turning lives around. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship you. You, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Oh, and you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are.
Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. And even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. And even when I don't see it, you're working. And even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, and you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Yes, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Yes, you are way make miracle work, promise keep. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness.
the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Thanks again for joining us for Grace at Home. And we are so glad that you kicked off the new year with us. And we are so excited to see what God does over the next year. Happy New Year, and we'll see you next time.